Okay, so, so let's, let's start. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Mark Huerta's company. Um, actually, I'm not sure how to pronounce the, the second part of the last name, of, but, but anyway. Um, so he completed his uh, PhD at the Observatoire de Paris in 2010 or nine. Um, then I think he was an ESO, ESO fellow for a year. And since 2010, he has been an assistant professor at the, uh, in, in Paris, at the, at the observatory in Paris. Um, and also um, a couple of years ago, I think he, he got uh, a Ramon y Cajal fellowship that he will take to Tenerife and actually is in Tenerife right now. Um, so Mark was a pioneer in the, in the use of, uh, in the use of deep, deep learning techniques in astronomy. Um, even back back when they, they were not as popular as uh, as they are now, uh, so he he basically showed the, the the astronomical community that you can actually use these these uh, AI AI methods to uh, to classify galaxies, as in the Hubble sequence, uh, basically as well as a professional astronomer would do. And also that these methods can be very fast if you use uh, uh, graphics cards uh, to to do the calculations. Um, it, it can be much faster than, for example, running a, a profile fitting code like Galfit on, on thousands of galaxies. So Mark has uh, over 100 uh, refereed papers, uh, more than 4,000 citations. Um, and lately we have been collaborating, uh, essentially applying these, these techniques to uh, simulations. So in simulations you can create synthetic images and do like uh, apples to apples comparisons to observations. So uh, once you involve uh, uh, these uh, uh, deep learning methods, you can do all, all sorts of uh, interesting experiments. Um, but I will let Mark uh, tell you more about it. So, so please, Mark. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm gonna share my screen. I think it's disabled. So I think you need to allow me to share. Oh, right, right, just a second. Yeah. Uh, I forgot. Make, make co-host. Okay. Okay. Now it should be okay. Yes. Okay. So you should be able to see my screen now. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to start the presentation. Okay. So it's a um, pleasure to be here. Thanks again for the invitation. And um, so as uh, Vicente mentioned, today I'm going to talk about several uh, attempts or uses of, of deep learning we have been investigating in our group as to understand um, galaxy formation. So um, I will assume, so I won't enter into the, uh, I won't enter into the technical details. I will mostly describe some, my idea is to describe some ideas. Some are more advanced, other less, uh, more in progress. Um, on, but please uh, be free to interrupt me if uh, something is not clear. Uh, or also, I mean, if you have question, technical questions, I'm also happy to, to answer them. But um, uh, so I could do it at the end or whatever. If you have also technical questions, just interrupt me. Um, so uh, I'm assuming also that uh, most of you hopefully are familiar with the field of galaxy formation because and i will try to you know emphasize some of the of the things we are we are doing with uh, with deep learning uh, and connecting especially simulations as vicente mentioned so um the so i think that the idea that and why deep learning and machine learning in or you know artificial intelligence in the broad sense is becoming more and more popular now in astrophysics is clearly driven by this uh, big data revolution that we are kind of waiting, still not arriving, but kind of uh, waiting in our community. And uh, you know, we have been experiencing an increase of the, of the number of, uh, of, the, of the size of surveys and also uh, not only observations, but also simulations. And, and we expect that this will increase even more. And so essentially, you know, the techniques that we were using before, which were uh, kind of manualish, cannot be applied anymore to these huge data sets. And this is where, you know, uh, machine learning uh, is kicking in and becoming extremely popular. Um, so to give you an idea of, of, of what this um, would mean in terms of data, I like this plot that I uh, showed, by, uh, uh, that Jarle Brinsman uh, showed me once. And this is uh, showing for the Euclid space mission, which is an easy mission that will fly next year, hopefully. Um, 
uh, in which uh, basically it's a dark energy emission that will observe a large fraction of the sky. And, uh, and it, this is comparing as a function of, of time, you see, the amount of the area of the sky that has been observed with HST. This is the different cameras on board HST. And then you can see that on, on total, you have observed about 12 square degrees in the sky since its launch in the late 90s. Now, when Euclid will be launched, just in a matter of now a few years or even a few months, uh, these day observations that we have done with HST at high resolution uh, will be completely you know, irrelevant in, the, in terms of, of numbers. Uh, so Euclid will observe more or less at a resolution comparable of HST, but uh, it will reach 15,000 square degrees in just a, a few months. So you realize that the amount of data that they need to process uh, it's completely different. We are in another order of, of magnitude. And it's not only, you know, uh, volume, this is a generation of volume, but also complexity. And, and this is, I think, what I was saying at the beginning, this is where I think people are becoming excited about, you know, you need to find a solution. And it turns out that AI just emerged at the right time. And, and so, you know, many scientific disciplines, but also astrophysics just jumped in and say, oh, wow, uh, this may be, the way out of this data. This is just a, a reflection of these. I'm plotting here the number of papers uh, in the ADS uh, database that I mentioned machine learning in the abstract. And you see there's a steady increase um, in, in parallel with this uh, with, um, you know, big data revolution. Uh, and so what people have been doing in these years is to saying, okay, I have this problem. I have this huge amount of data, this complexity. Let's see how machine learning uh, can behave, that, uh, behave on that problem. And, and, and so we are still at this stage, or at least in the past years, of experimentation. Let's try to see how it behaves for that particular problem. And I think uh, I don't have time to go all over all everything that has been done, uh, because as you can see, there are many, many papers, and every day now there are more and more papers. But I would say that uh, as, a, as a, you know, bottom line, I think in the past years, many works have shown um, that machine learning or especially deep learning can indeed be you know one way to process this data and can help in you know uh, making uh, these tasks efficiently for this particular data and as Tent um, said i think one of the obvious ways of i think uh, applying machine learning for example is for uh, everything which is classification which is at the end uh, why AI techniques have become so popular in the first place. And uh, so everything which has to deal with classification, uh, which we call supervised classification, which could be galaxies or stars or even it, uh, so want to put things in boxes, uh, machine learning has been very, uh, very efficient and shown to be very efficient. Uh, uh, it can and also be applied to something that is, uh, instead of classification, you can go a step, a, a step further and say, instead of using only putting things in boxes, you can say, I'm going to measure things. And we call these in machine learning regressions. And these are typical examples of, uh, you know, for example, in galaxy evolution, you want to measure redshifts of galaxies. So you do this with photometric redshifts. And it turns out that uh, deep learning and machine learning can also do this properly. You can measure also sizes of galaxies, what we call morphometry. Uh, morphometry. And these also can uh, be done uh, easily with machine learning. Uh, you can do SED fitting, uh, characterization of lensings. So uh, let's say everything that relies also on kind of, of training. Uh, and, and so it's not only about classification. You can also you know, do this kind of, of measurements. And uh, another field in which you know, um, these techniques have been becoming uh, quite efficient is in everything which has to do with object detection, which in machine learning or in image processing, we call segmentation, in which we try to identify objects in a given, in a given field. So just, I'm gonna uh, over, um, I, I think these are things that are already, you know, uh, obvious applications of machine learning that I think are becoming uh, normalized. So I will overview uh, some of the examples, but the main goal of this talk is, is to go a bit beyond these and see what, what could be done uh, next. So, for example, as Vicente mentioned, you know, uh, classification is obvious thing, and in galaxy evolution, one obvious thing that you can do is morphological classification of galaxies, and 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 it has been shown in many papers, but what this, uh, one of the first, that you know, deep learning really can solve this issue somehow, uh, and um, 
So this is showing uh, the, for the kind of, for the high redshift galaxies, the agreement between visual classification of galaxies and the x axis and you know um, automatic in the y axis and you see that the agreement is very good around ninety percent and and you see that before the deep learning revolution let 's say uh, this was a problem, and even you know with previous machine learning techniques uh, such as kernel machines, the agreement was not um, not so high. So this is a, an example where deep learning jumps in and really uh, solves uh, the problem. And uh, uh, as we have seen in other uh, fields uh, uh, for classification. An example for, you know, uh, as I was saying, re what we call supervised regression in which also deep learning is performing well is uh, for uh, determining um, photometric redshifts of galaxies. And this is again an example from a paper last year uh, in which people show that uh, when you use, you know, uh, more traditional methods, again, so this is showing the spectroscopic redshift of a galaxy, so determined with spectroscopy, which should be more accurate, and this is what you determine in the y-axis with photometry. So you want this to be in the one-to-one -one line, and you see that there, everything that is a dispersion here are errors. You see that the, the line is becoming narrower when you use deep learning or convolutional neural networks. And this is because you are combining not only color information, as you will do here, but also uh, morphology. And this is done automatically with, with deep learning. So this is another example where you can, you know, as I said, not only classify, but measure things quite accurately. And there are many works, you know, uh, into that direction. Uh, and, and the third example I was uh, talking um, about where I think, you know, things are becoming more uh, accepted, it's in uh, everything which has to do with detection of objects. And, and this is, a, for example, a problem that happens a lot in, in deep imaging, for those who are not familiar, is what we call the blending of objects. And, uh, and as, as we go uh, and have deeper and deeper images, the chances that two galaxies or two objects overlap with each other are high, especially in the LSST, for example, we have more than 50% of objects that are expected to blend. And this, of, of course, if you don't you detect these blendings, and if you want to do precision cosmology, like by measuring shapes of galaxies and so on, this is a significant uh, addition to your error budget that can you know be uh, at the limit of or uh, affect your your um, your scientific conclusions so you want to you know uh, be able to detect and deblend objects and this is a traditionally t challenging problem and it turns out that you know uh, machine learning also can help in this and and there are also lots of people starting to working on that uh, i'm illustrating here a paper um, we published last year, uh, and I will go very briefly on this, but essentially what uh, you want to see if uh, you can, you know, use machine learning to separate two objects that are blended. And, and you can see here, uh, so just, uh, you can focus on this plot on the left here, in which we show how well we recover the, the flux of a galaxy that was blended. So you want these, so you have two blended galaxies, you know, uh, what's the flux of the one of the galaxies and you want to see how well you recover it. So you want these to be as close as possible to the one-to-one -one line. And you see that when you do uh, deep learning, the typical error that you do in the magnitude is around 0.1, okay? In the, uh, even if objects are blended, you can separate the fluxes of both. If you use more traditional methods, which is here on the right, like, you know, uh, people will use extractor, which has been used in the past, you see how large is the scatter, the typical error in magnitude for exactly the same data set it's around 0.5, which is much larger. So again, it's a huge improvement. You don't only go faster, but you improve the quality of your measurements. Okay, so in, in and, and, and again, this is a complex task in which you are, you know, both detecting and measuring. And it turns out again, that uh, machine learning is something that can help us beating some systematics. Um, introducing some others, but uh, uh, this is again another illustration of where things, you know, obvious applications of, of machine learning. Um, so as I said, I, I just overviewed some things uh, that are, uh, let's say, I think more mature. I'm happy to go back to these examples if you're interested. Uh, today, I wanted to, you know, focus on, on two main questions, which I think are interesting to me and we have been working for the past years in, in our group um, and uh, that are not so obvious, you know, close to data applications of machine learning uh, and which are, um, let's say, uh, first one would be uh, how can we make discoveries and, and can you, uh, okay, are we, we are going to process all this data mostly automatically uh, with these um, techniques because we don't have a choice. 
uh, but can we make uh, discoveries? And how do we make you know uh, discoveries in this in this new time? Um, and also uh, the second question I would like to focus on is: uh, Can we use uh, these techniques to you know help constraining the physics of galaxy formation? Can we go understand uh, a bit you know? better or I mean with the goal at the end is understand how galaxies form and can these techniques help doing us um, something that we couldn't do with other more traditional approaches. So I'll try to show some examples of other different things. Please uh, interrupt me if there's something question. So first thing is um, how do we make discoveries and then uh, I think uh, one of the main thing here is that uh, the future big data sets as I said you uh, will be processed mostly automatically and, and which means that most of the data will never be looked by humans. So, and however, we know by experience and from history that unknown unknowns, let's say, is where interesting new science will be found. So many things uh, that we don't expect are, are where probably we can find, you know, interesting science. Now, most of the things that uh, I've been showing you are rely on training sets. So, for example, you classify galaxies, you, 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 you say tell a priori what the the, the train the algorithm you tell at the algorithm uh, what you are looking for right um and you train to do that and it do it does it perfectly or it does it very good but it does what you what it was trained to do right uh while well, this is not what you do uh, what we do is trying to i mean find uh, potentially interesting objects and this is what we call uh in machine learning uh uh, anomaly detection. So we want to detect things that are out of the norm, but we don't know exactly what we're looking for. Okay. And so you see, it's a, it's a different way of, of dealing with the data and it's more and uh, what we call unsupervised because you don't know what you're looking for. And um, so, and in the end, what you want to detect is, uh, you know, given a set of data, you want to detect uh, outliers or things that are abnormal with some metric because this is probably the things that you want to look at and everything that is let's say as expected um, you don't need to look at it right uh, because it's what you were expecting and so it's a way to of reducing or uh, the, the the potentiality of you know discoveries to a smaller data set that you can handle um, so what would be you know uh, an anomaly in that respect and imagine you have your data and uh, your data, whatever it is, imaging or spectroscopy or whatever, follows some probability distribution, right? That you don't know, but it's somehow a probability distribution. Uh, and, and it means that, so an anomaly in that particular case will be something that given this probability distribution of your data set uh, has a probability of a given object that is very small, given, smaller than a given epsilon that I could define. And if you find that this object, given my probability distribution as a very small probability of being observed, this would mean that, you know, this is a potentially interesting object or something that is it's anomalous or, or, or weird. Um, so the question is, how do we compute this probability distribution of my data? How do I know how my data is distributed? Because if I know how my data is distributed, then I can, you know, look for these outliers. And this is, uh, again, a field in which machine learning can also help, okay? And, and you can, you know, use uh, machine learning to determine the probability distributions of your data. And um, uh, for, uh, this is, for example, what, you know, what we call generative models uh, precisely do. Right, in which basically, uh, again, I'm not entering into the technical details. I'm just, you know, uh, saying with words what uh, these algorithms do. But you can, of course, ask me if you are interested. But the idea here would be that, uh, again, what you want to estimate is the probability distribution of your data or the probability density function. So, what you have some data, which x could be images, could be spectra, which combination of both, and you want to learn what is the density function or probability PDF of your data. Um, you can use what we call the deep generative models, okay, that learn with uh, some of these, uh, these box are neural networks that learn this PDF. And, uh, and a family of these, just for those who are interested, are, uh, you know, uh, what we call VAEs that I think uh, in the previous colloquium you heard about, uh, generative adversarial networks or other kind of uh, models. But the idea here is that you learn the distribution. And once you have learned the distribution, you can sample from that particular distribution and generate new data, 
okay? Because you know your PDF. And this is why they are called generative models. And they have become very popular because, you know, they can generate very realistic images. This is an example of one of the latest ones, but this is continually improving, in which basically you, you use some data to learn the PDF, and then you sample from that particular PDF. And every sample from that PDF in that particular case is an image, okay? And if you have learned probably your PDF, you can sample and then generate images that look like real images. And these all, all, all images you are seeing here, which are different objects, are just fake images generated by this model who has learned the PDF, right? Now, what it means that you have learned the PDF, it means that, uh, again, you can look for outliers because you can compute the probability of the different uh, data. Um, and this is something that we uh, can use. Uh, this is an example of a paper we published uh, early this year, and there's a more coming, in which basically uh, we use uh, what we call here WGANs, but this is somehow not so important. The idea is that you use a generative model here to estimate the probability. And then once you have this PDF estimated, you can go and ask for every object you detect in your survey, ask what is the probability of this object, right? Uh, given the PDF I've learned. Um, and then uh, you can you know, detect somehow measuring some kind of you know, anomaly score, which would mean if this object, how, how rare is, is this object? And then, then by cutting in this anomaly score, you can restrict the objects that are more interested. And again, this is fully unsupervised. I have no introduction of any prior knowledge of my data. I'm just you know, throwing in the data, learning a PDF, and then asking what is the probability of observing a given object, given that PDF. There's no labeling here. That's why it's called unsupervised. And um, I'm showing an example of, of how uh, this could be applied, for example, uh, into a survey uh, from the HSC, uh, the, the HSC survey, which probably you have heard about, which is a survey from um, using the Subaru telescope. And uh, this is a precursor for SST, let's say, you know, in which we observe, you know, deep imaging, uh, but with an eight meter telescope, so it's quite deep. Uh, and the game we played is saying, okay, can we, you know, uh, look for resting objects. So what did is we trained this generative model on the HSC and then computed this PDF given this imaging. Uh, and then uh, given all individual detections, we run this to this, you know, trained uh, generative model and compute an anomaly score or a probability. And we can identify which are the most unlikely objects in a given image or in a given set of, of survey. And then narrowing that way, the, the, the trying to, you know, potentially discover interesting objects. Of course, this is not so trivial because many of the objects that you will detect, in fact, will be, for, exa for example, pipeline errors or things that were not properly, you know, reduced. Uh, but, you know, you are already reducing your data set a lot. And then you can then, you know, use other techniques to explore the reduced data set of potential anomalies. Some examples of anomalies that we discovered are these interesting objects, for example, by playing this game, we find a bunch of objects in the HSC survey that look like, you know, red galaxies with a blue dot over here. And, uh, and the, for example, in that particular galaxy, it turned out that it had some HST imaging, and it looks quite weird. You see this galaxy over here with some disturbances over here and the source, uh, a white, a blue source here. Uh, it turns out that this is a dwarf galaxy, and it could be that uh, what these blue dots that we see are, you know, off-center black holes um, that are affecting, you know, the, the galaxy shape. We didn't know that we, we were not the first. There are others that have been detected, but it's nice to see that you can kind of identify these objects that are rare uh, by just, you know, applying this game in a completely unsupervised way. Um, this is another example of anomaly that we detected these blue dots here that were very uh, strange. Uh, and it turns out that it's part of a larger dwarf galaxy, which is here, which is now, which is quite well known, but as these uh, blue dots of star formation, probably because it's interacting with this larger one. And, 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 and you see that, you know, also this is something that was picked up. Um, so again, it, it requires some post-processing, but it's an interesting way of without looking at the data, you know, trying to figure out how I make discoveries. And I think this is a potentially interesting, uh, you know, application of machine learning and things that will have to be done at some point. And, and so it's, it's, it's quite exciting. Uh, so for the rest of, of the talk, I want to spend most of the time, you know, talking about 
uh, the second question I raised, and this is something uh, also the work we have been doing with Vicente uh, about, you know, how we can use machine learning or deep learning in that particular case to try to learn more about the physics of galaxy formation. And this, uh, I mean, this question but the idea here, you know, we have uh, lots of uh, knowledge put in, in simulations of galaxy formation. We have lots of data that are increasing in quality and complexity. So, uh, and, and how can you use these techniques to link both and see if the things agree or what are the physical processes that, are in your, that can best explain your data? So, uh, as you probably know, uh, so, you know, we are now in a regime in which, you know, we are producing nice simulation. This is an example of the TNG simulation in which Vicente is heavily involved um, and, and which, so we are able to simulate cosmological volumes. So starting from the Big Bang and then we make, uh, putting some physics uh, on it, some subgrid physics, of course, which, which is sometimes not resolved. But in any case, we are able to make galaxies evolve. And, and creating these sort of movies of single galaxies evolving, right? So, um, and this is, uh, so definitely something that we cannot do in observations, right? So in observations, given the time scales, you will observe a galaxy, a snapshot, in a moment of its uh, lifetime, let's say, if you want to call a lifetime for a galaxy, but in a moment of its, of its evolution, you will observe a snapshot. Um, while in the simulation, you have the whole history, right? So, the game, of course, here is to connect the two. So is the, you know, what's given a, a snapshot of an observation of a galaxy, can I, you know, constrain its formation history by, you know, using the knowledge I've imprinted in the simulation, for example. This is one way of, of addressing this. The other way is um, you want to ask, are the, is the physics that I've put in my simulation correct and explains the observations, uh, for example. So there are many, so many things that you can do in linking the two. And I'll try to show you some, some examples of this. So the idea here uh, that we have been playing uh, for the last years now is trying to say, okay, uh, machine learning and especially deep learning is extremely powerful at ex extracting uh, subtle features in the data, right? Without supervision, you know, just throw the data, complex data, high dimension, and it can find some features. Um, so if we manage, and so the, the, uh, if we manage to, you know, take the simulations and forward model uh, to the observational plane by creating mock observations, uh, then these mock observations and observations live in the same space. And then you can use machine learning to do all sorts of experiments there and try to see if these guys are, are, are indeed, you know, um, living in the same space, uh, if uh, they do match, if um, uh, there's some physical process, the advantage here again from the mock observations, then even if I have mock observations here, I can go back to the full 3D evolution history. So you can kind of isolate a physical process and see if you find signatures of this physical process in the observations. Um, so I'm gonna show you some examples of this. Um, so one idea here for so the first thing uh, that you can do uh, is, sorry, this should be in the other direction. So the first thing that you can do is, uh, obvious thing is you can, you know, you want to link these two and you can uh, train on, on the observations and, and see what happens in the simulations or the opposite, right? And see how things uh, work together. So I will show you first an example of training in the, uh, in the observations and, and what are the things that you can ask um, and for example, this is uh, one example of uh, a work we did uh, with uh, Vicente in which the idea here was uh, we're asking ourselves, um, do you know, uh, current simulations uh, reproduce the diversity of galaxy morphologies in the local universe? And, and so this is something that is, uh, has been a, you know, a long-standing problem for, for um, uh, simulations in which you, know, you want to make sure, so the, the, you know that the local universe today has a diversity of galaxies. There are these, there are for a very long time, it has been difficult for the simulations to have the right tuning of physics to make this diversity. Right, so you can try to ask the question uh, how close we are, quanti uh, quantify this properly. And this is a typical example in which you want to, you know, train in the observations and see if you, you find the same uh, distribution 
in the simulations because this is telling you that you're doing something uh, how how far you are so again so again this is an example in which you go from the observations to the simulations and the idea here again is quite simple you go to the local universe the sloan uh, you have some uh, training set this is again supervised you have you on on morphologies of galaxies you will train your neural networks there and so you have a CNN model that is able to estimate galaxy morphologies. And as I showed you at the beginning, this is quite straightforward and it works quite well. And now you can say, okay, um, let's take a, not a real universe, but a simulated universe. We create some mock SDSS galaxies and we try to classify them, very simple, with this particular model and see if things agree with the observed universe, right? So uh, this is telling you something about how well I'm doing and if I can trust uh, most, I mean, if the physics that has been plugged in here is able to reproduce the diversity of morphologies. Um, so if you do that, this is an example of, uh, you know, uh, this should be TNG, sorry, it's illustrious, but it's TNG, of uh, examples of galaxies that are being classified, you know, by the, by the machine in four different types, okay? So again, trained in the observations, and you can see that, so this would be like uh, the machine said, these are simulated ellipticals, these are zeros, these are early spirals and late spirals. So the machine is able to put different uh, objects. So with the models trained, he will, you know, uh, pick which galaxy should be in which, in which box. And uh, we'll come back to that uh, later. But anyway, you, you get a classification of the different um, illustrious or TNG uh, galaxies. And then you can try to start doing some quantitative approaches uh, of measurements of how well uh, the mock universe uh, compares to the observed universe. Uh, one first order uh, statistical quantity that you can measure is the abundance of galaxies or what we call the mass function, which is as a function of the stellar mass of the galaxy, how many galaxies we have per volume, the unit volume. And you see that, uh, well, by definition, uh, so here, are, you know, solid lines are simulations, dashed lines are the observations. And you see that by definition, the total uh, stellar mass function, if you put all galaxies together, agrees quite well. But also now you start splitting these between what the machine classified as early type and late type, so disks and spheroids, you see that you are doing quite well. So the simulations kind of, you know, agree reasonably well, except maybe at the very mass end where you have an excess of disks over here, but on ov overall, uh, you are getting uh, quite well the, the distribution of galaxies. I'm sorry, can yes. I interrupt you a little bit? Sure, of course, yeah. So, uh, in this thing, you were, you're classifying, I mean, the real galaxies uh, in simulation and in, in data. So I was wondering, before you were talking about these peculiar galaxies, so did you do that also for these weird galaxies? Also in, a, in the local volume that you are, uh, studying in the simulation uh what do you mean these peculiar galaxies in the simulation yeah well yeah i mean and compare it also with observations uh for the outliers you mean yeah okay i'm going back to this so this is uh so this is a fully supervised thing so what we do is uh, we try to associate so it's supervised so in the sense the machine can only tell you uh, okay so when it's unsupervised is when you get those things Exactly. Because then okay. you are saying, I'm going back to this. Yeah. I, I hope it will okay, be okay. clearer. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So anyway, so these, uh, no, that's perfect. Thanks. Uh, interrupt? Please interrupt me again if you, yeah. So this is very interesting. Uh, just, so why do you use a, a supervised approach to do this comparison in not an unsupervised approach like the, the work that you show us that when you get the PDF from the, from the data itself? So why yeah. this is, this comes next. This comes next. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. It comes next. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I was saying that in, in this supervised approach, you see that things match reasonably well. And even if you, uh, so this is telling you that, I mean, it's a way of checking that the universe that you observe, that you simulate matches the universe that you observe um, uh, using, again, uh, machine learning. So somehow, um, which, uh, and it, it's, it tells you if you go in the right direction or not. So it's interesting, some, some side note here uh, about, you know, what I was telling at the beginning here about, you know, mocking observations uh, into uh, simulation, sorry, into the data space. And this is important how you do things, right? And this, I know, I mean, Vicente is a, an expert on this, but it's important on how you do this mocking. This is an example of how things can change if you don't, for example, uh, 
don't add a very realistic noise. So this is again the same plot I was showing you before. So the top row is the same. So you see the agreement between uh, the simulation and the observations. Now, if you add a noise which is not realistic, for example, that don't, uh, doesn't contain background stars properly, or the same statistics of background galaxies that is Sloan, you see that things may make, um, turn out to be different. And you measure a, a, an excess of this in the, in the simulation which might not be true, is just because you know, the, the, the mocking is not realistic enough. So this is clearly a caveat and something that you need to be uh, very careful of. Uh, so I, I forgot to put the uh, references here, but you can look at the papers of uh, Bottrell, Connor Bottrell, that has log, uh, worked a lot on, on how realistic things need to be to really learn something. Okay, so I'm going now addressing the, the question that was asked uh, or, or twice, which is, okay, this is a, a fully uh, supervised approach in the sense that, uh, you know, I'm classifying galaxies into boxes uh, based on the observations, and then I'm, I'm throwing in the, the simulation, right? So by throwing in the simulation, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm only allowing the, the machine to put things in these boxes. Right, and this is a clear, uh, um, you know, um, weak point of supervised learning because uh, imagine, uh, you know, if you have a, a machine that classifies cats and dogs, and you suddenly show a horse, the machine will not tell you. Supervised machine will not tell you this is a horse. It will tell you it's a cat with the probability, and it's a dog with that probability, right? Because it's only trained to do cats and dogs. It doesn't know anything about the others. So this could also happen in the simulations in which, okay, I'm training to classify things into early and late type. It will put this in a given box, but maybe, you know, there are many objects that are not perfectly fitting these boxes because, you know, they are far from that. Or, or I'm, you know, showing horses while the observations are cats, let's say, right? So how do you measure that? How do you say if they are actually leaving the same space? And this again goes back to this unsupervised approach in which you can measure the PDFs of the different data sets and see how far and how close they are. So this is again a work that we have been, uh, that we recently put out uh, in the um, archive. That's also Vicente is a co-author in which the idea now is see how things match together in terms of probability in, in a probabilistic point of view. So if I have um, so some uh, observations and can I compute the probability of an observed galaxy and a probability of a simulated galaxy or a probability distribution, uh, do they match? Okay, so do they have uh, the same probability? Let's say so if I will say it again, if you have a, the PDF observed or of the or observations, right? And, uh, and you compute from, with that PDF, the probability of simulations, do they follow the same? Or do, are, are simulations, do have simulations, you know, larger or smaller probabilities, or what are the probabilities of, of simulations following the same PDF? And this is again telling you how close they are, like now in an unsupervised way, okay? So basically telling you, uh, are uh, simulations horses compared to cats, or do they actually live in the same space? Um, so to do this, we did, uh, we use another, you know, generative model. Uh, again, I'm not entering a lot in the details. This is another way of, again, the, the same idea is I'm, I'm using these generative models to learn the PDF. Okay. In that particular example, instead of GANs, we use what we call pixel CNNs, uh, because they have an explicit, you know, you can estimate an explicit PDF with the GANs is less, is more tricky. Um, I have here some technical details, but I think I can skip them. But essentially you go pixel by pixel and you will estimate a, a PDF of, the, of your, uh, at the end, the end product of this training is that given your SDSS galaxies, you will estimate a PDF, right? Um, and uh, once you have this, this PDF, um, you can, uh, so basically you take this loan as again, the, the DR7, you run through pixel CNN and you estimate uh, a, a PDF of your pixels, let's say. And once you have done that, uh, for example, what you can do is, uh, as I said at the beginning, you can, you know, because you have learned a PDF, you can sample your model and see if you generate galaxies. So these are, you know, fake uh, SDSS galaxies. Uh, the resolution is not uh, great for this example, but it's the, you can see that, you know, the model is able to generate so we the distribution and you can sample from it. Uh, and the other thing that you can do, of course, is then, okay, now 
uh, I, I take some simulations here. Um, and then I create again, as I said, some mock SDSS images. And I, I run these through the pixel CNN train on SDSS and I estimate some PDFs for those. And I can know, and, and this helps me quantifying how close are simulations and observations now in an unsupervised way without imposing any boxes, right? Um, so uh, I'm going quite rapidly in the details because otherwise I run out of time. But um, uh, this is, you can check out this paper, which is now in the archive. It's uh, almost accepted. Sorry, um, can I in yes. interrupt yeah, sure. you again? Uh, sure. Maybe, I mean, you tell me just if it's, I mean, it doesn't fit like uh, your talk right now. But I was wondering, you can, uh, as you mentioned before, with the unsupervised way of uh, uh, analyzing the observations, the, the galaxies that are weird, then you do it uh, unsupervised, right? But then yes. when you have the result of those real galaxies, then you can run it supervised with those kind of galaxies, right? The ones which the are... Simulations. Uh... Yes. Yeah, the for one, example, the one that the one that you were saying, uh, there's like these galaxies with a black hole off center. Yes. Right? They yes. have a, a like a very um peculiar morphology. Right. So you run it unsupervised, then you see these weird galaxies, and then you run it supervised on simulations to find yeah. each one of these kind. It could be Yeah, for example, this is a good uh, thing. Uh, we haven't played this game, but this is something that you can do essentially. Yes, yes, definitely. Oh, so in that particular good. In that particular exercise, what we were doing here is, you know, trying to see how close are simulations and observations, right? Okay. And but I could do that, right? Yes, it's, it's possible like that. Yes, okay. definitely. So then you can once you identify okay. these anomalous objects that you are interested in, you can uh, yeah. train a supervised algorithm to find them more. Yeah, because okay. I think it's quite uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I think it's quite uh, interesting, especially this. Uh, galaxies, the dwarf ones that are off center, uh, with the black holes off center. I mean, I thought it was yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a good yeah, point. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I actually got a comment there. <laughs> I have a yeah, question also. So, I'm actually, I'm, it's a very nice example this of the black hole off center. Maybe the, the mm -hmm. galaxies are very simple for a neural network because, in general, when you get a PDF from your data, the PDF is only a reflection of what the neural network can get from the features. So right. what I'm trying to say is that the PDF is not the actual PDF. You just get an interpretation of the PDF by the neural network. And you see this a lot in the generative model when, just, when I know, you generate the image of a fish. You see that it looks like a fish, but when you look into detail, you see that the eyes are in the wrong place. Or maybe it has, one, it has only one eye, no? You see yes. this a lot in generative models. So the PDF that the neural rep reproduces is not the PDF. It's just something that it helps it reproduce the image. And it thinks, okay, this is good enough for me. Well, so, yeah, you can you you cannot not, you, you can you cannot know uh, if the PDF is indeed the, the right PDF, let's say. Yeah, so, so the, how can we do that then? Because you know, I had the same problem. I mean, in astronomy, we had this problem now that many people don't want to. Yeah, they have problem accepting these techniques, not these new techniques. They, there is kind of resistance, not to to artificial intelligence. And I think we have to address these problems. No, like, how do we find? The, the right PDF of, or a PDF that has some physics on it so that we don't get monsters, not like fishes with three eyes or something like that. Right. So, but th this is what you can check, you know, by doing, uh, I mean, a generative uh, sampling of your model, right? Uh, but I agree. So that the, the, the PDF is not, uh, is not perfect, but I think you are going, um, uh, directly to the data space and estimating uh, from the data. It's a way, I mean, it's a way of estimating a PDF, uh, which, I mean, I agree you cannot be 100% sure that it's the right PDF. I mean, but it's impossible. Yeah, but No, it's good enough. You show that it's good enough for many things. Huh? Right. But, uh, okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So there are some limitations. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the idea here is, let's say, let, uh, you estimate these uh, PDFs uh, or, um, I mean, it's a bit convoluted. This is what we call the log likelihood ratio. I'm not entering into details, but basically you can compute the distribution of this quantity for uh, Sloan galaxies. This is what the observations, this is what you see in orange over here, okay? And, uh, and then for this, uh, simulations. And what you want if observations and simulations do match, that you know the distributions are the same, let's say, okay? If they are not the same, it means that you know the network is seeing something different, okay? So the closest is the line to the yellow one, 
the better, let's say, to simplify. So you see that if you use, you know, um, a very simple CERSIC modeling for your images, you, know, you see the model clearly see that there's something very different from the, observa from the observations, right? And, as you, and then the different lines here show different simulations, okay? Maybe you're not familiar with this, but this is the old illustrious one, which we knew, uh, we know had some uh, problems in reproducing, for example, the diversity of galaxies and, and the sizes and so on. This is uh, our new run, the TNG, uh, in the 100 volume, so a, a same resolution as Illustris, but with a different physics, and TNG 50, better resolution. And you see how, you know, the, 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 this metric is able to capture the improvement in the simulations. But so you see that the Illustris is farther away than you have the TNG 100 and then the TNG 50. Uh, closer to the observations, but still not uh, exactly on top of them. So again, this is a way of statistically, I'm saying it's a statistic way of <clears throat> looking how far simulations are from observations. Um, okay, so I think I'm, I'm seeing I'm, I'm running really out of time. So uh, I wanted to address because one last point, but I realize I won't have too much time, but I, I think I'll, I'll just, um, fly through it. So I, 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 I show you some examples, you know, on, so I, sorry, it's inverted, on training on observations and going to simulations. And, and now uh, I'm going I, to show you some examples on, you know, doing the opposite. So if you have some physical information here, you know, because you know the history of formation of the galaxy, you can say, okay, I'm gonna isolate the galaxy have the physical process and see if I have can find traces of that particular physical process in the observations. Okay, so this is a different way of processing of, of proceeding. Here you know you want to see if they match. Here you want to see, okay, I, I want to ask if a given physical process uh, is able to explain the observations in some sense. Um, so I'm going to skip these and, and, so, and give you an example. This is uh, an example of, of this exercise we did uh, now uh, last a couple of years back in which the idea here is again Let's try to see if instead of, you know, uh, comparing observations to simulation to that direction, let's try to define a, a physical process and find signatures on that. And for that, we use another set of simulations, which are zoom in, which because uh, high resolution. Uh, these are the Vela, the Vela simulations by the Avishai Deckel group. And the idea here was, okay, uh, in this simulation, so um, what you're seeing here is the stellar mass. And, and time for a given galaxy, just one galaxy following how, so, so this is, you know, a high redshift, uh, so early universe, low redshift, and see how the, the gas in the galaxy evolves, the dark matter and the stellar mass grows, right, with time in the central region of the galaxy. And, and when uh, this uh, group was observing these simulations, they realized that many galaxies go through this phase when you look at the gas in the central region in which you suddenly see an increase of gas, cold gas in the central regions, and which is rapidly uh, forming a lot of stars, you see here, so basically building a bulge. And then the gas is depleted and then you see uh, the, a decrease in the center. And this peak of, of you know, gas inflow towards the center, it's a way of building the bulges and it has been, you know, called uh, by, by these people as a compaction event because, you know, the galaxy suddenly becomes very compact in stars in the center and it's a way of building bulges. So the idea, and, and we, they saw this in the simulation, but we didn't know, uh, is this something that happens in the data? So you can do it by looking up some uh, observ um, observational proxies. But the idea we had here is that let's see if, you know, you can use machine learning to do that by just defining on the physics based on the simulation. So the, uh, what we did here is uh, essentially, okay, let's transform this into a classification problem, okay? Let's say uh, we take the, the simulation uh, metadata in which you know the full history of the galaxy. We know that uh, galaxy, and, and then try to put galaxies in, in three different boxes, but now based on the physics, let's say, okay? We define galaxies being in a pre-compaction phase, galaxies which are exactly in the compaction phase, and galaxies which are already past this compaction phase and see if, uh, and uh, because we can do this in the simulations because we can follow the time, we cannot do this in the observations, but we can train to recognize these phases and see if these phases appear in the observations and what are the properties. So then the game would be to go to the observations in which you have only one snapshot. You don't have the whole history of the galaxy, of course, you only have one snapshot, but 
maybe you can use, you know, this machine that has been trained to classify in boxes to look for where in these phases they lie, okay? Uh, again, this is assuming that they live in the same space, but I just mentioned that and you can test that with the PDFs. So again, we follow the same kind of approach in which you take the cosmological simulation, you generate the mock images, as observed by HST this time from the zoom in simulation, and you put them in different in, in three classes. You transform this into a classification problem. So this would be pre, uh, we know that this would be pre blue nugget phase or pre compaction. This could be compaction phase and post compaction phase based on this history. Okay, you see that, I mean, you know, by eye is not trivial to see. Okay, so the, the game we are playing is, is the, the, the neural network able to find these differences uh, with a definition that is not labeled by humans, but labeled by physics. Um, and, 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 and the answer is, was at that time that it works quite nicely. And in fact, uh, you, can be, you can recover um, based only on the images, what are the most likely phase uh, this galaxy is. For example, this is a galaxy, another galaxy, you say the same, uh, 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 plot, so the gas with the compaction phase, the stars, so many galaxies in that simulation goes through this phase. And, and what I'm showing here is the output, the probability output, so you transform this into a classification, what is the probability of the neural network to classify this as a, you know, a pre-compaction, a compaction, or a post-compaction. And you see that when you enter into compaction phase, the probability increases, so the, the network knows that this is a compaction galaxy. Again, you are showing only one snapshot. You are, uh, you are not showing the whole history. And, and when it goes out, you see that the probabilities increase. So the machine is able somehow to recognize this based only on a physical definition. We don't know exactly what the machine is picking up, but it's a way of you know, saying, can I define some physical information and try to find this physics in the data? There are some caveats related to that, and, and as I told you about the, you know, how simulations match observations, but this is a, a potentially interesting way of you know, introducing some temporal information in your data uh, from only the snapshots. Okay, of course, this is just a proof of concept, but I think uh, it opens a lot of, of possibilities. So this is an example that was put for this uh, press release in which it shows the process in which you see, you know, uh, from the output of the simulation, the high, simula uh, high resolution, this uh, pre-compaction phase, the compaction phase, and then the post-compaction phase in which you see here the inflow of gas. Then the same galaxy, you know, uh, put at the HST resolution. Um, and then what the net, these are real observations that the network identified as being in that particular phase, okay? Of course, this is an obvious example that was selected for, for, uh, for illustration, but you see, you know, how you define things on physics and then you can classify objects not on the visual appearance, but on the, on the physical uh, mechanisms. So then you can go and study the properties of these compaction uh, galaxies, what happened to them and so on. Okay, I think I'm going out of time. I, want, I had another example of how can you can do this to, to try to understand the origins of, of giant clumps in galaxies. Again, following the same idea of, you know, going back and forth from simulations and observations. This is a, a recent paper um, that we put, two papers that we are putting out, one that's already out, the other that it's in process, in which you are, you know, asking uh, how clamps are formed in galaxies and, and can we put constraints on the physical formation of, of clamps. You know, high redshift galaxies have these um, typical very uh, bright spots that we call clamps and that uh, we don't know exactly if these are real clamps or it's an artifact of blending of different uh, normal star forming regions. We don't know how long they live. We don't know if they have uh, impact on the formation of bulges in galaxies and so on. So uh, uh, it's an interesting topic to address also with this uh, machine learning and comparing things in the same uh, plane. So unfortunately, those, I don't have time. Sorry, yeah. those were observations? These are observations, yes. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, but we play the game of, you know, doing the same in observations and simulations. I don't have time, but I can answer questions if you like, because I was told to stop and I think I'm, I'm already out of time. Uh, so I will skip this. Um, I'm happy to answer question or if you look at the paper, it's, it, this paper is already out. So I will uh, stop here by saying that I think um, I went very quickly on obvious applications of, of deep supervised learning, which I think is the obvious, and I think it's kind of uh, reaching maturity, at least in some obvious applications. So a question was asked about, you know, uh, um, you know the, the 
reticence of the community to accept these techniques. I think this is true when you go to do fancy things, when you do start to do no normal things like classification or uh, regressions, people are starting to accept that this is a way to go, especially to process the big data that, we come, that will come. So I think, uh, and I'm not taking a lot of risk by saying that these will be integrated at different levels in many of the future pipelines that we will uh, use uh, in the future, for example, for object classification, segmentation, and other regressive tasks like uh, photometric redshifts and so on. Uh, it's still in the process, but this will be normalized sooner or later. And, um, and I think it's happening uh, and, uh, because, you know, we still are in the phase in which, you know, we publish a paper in which you say, hey, I use deep learning for that and it works nice. Uh, but I see more and more papers in which deep learning now is part of the methods in the section of the, in a, it has, it's a methodological section in the paper and the paper is about something else. And this is a sign to me that it's somehow been accepted. It's part of reaching maturity. You don't write, I mean, we are, there are still many papers like that, but there are also other papers in which it's not, hey, I use deep learning. It's just, I want to do that and methods, I use machine learning to do that. And, and this is a sign that things are becoming normalized, at least for, you know, um, classification. If you write a paper and say, I use machine learning to classify galaxies between early type and late type, nobody will tell you what, what uh, it's, it's something that it's already accepted. For other things, it's not the case, but I think, uh, and, and this is, uh, I'm excited about, you know, these new ways of applying this. I think the future is exciting. And I, try, I kind of showed you that, I mean, we can use to these techniques to do a blind search of interesting objects in large surveys with a potential and how, you know, uh, you can use this back and forth between simulation and observation to eventually constrain some physics. It's still greenish. Uh, there's many details that need to be understood. But I think this idea of, you know, mm, try to define some physical process in the simulations and then try to find indications in the data and so on, it's something that it's uh, very, very appealing. And uh, yeah, so I apologize for being late. Thank you very much for uh, listening and I'm happy to take uh, questions. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, Mark. That, that was a fascinating talk, and we already have a couple of questions. Um, okay, uh, M M M Miguel. I think I think Vero was first. Huh? Oh, Vero was Vero first. Was there, you, you are you, you appear on top of Vero, but okay. Vero. Thank you very much, Miguel. Can I? Sure. Yeah. So, I was just uh, uh, I was wondering about uh, your opinion. I mean. I agree that now we see a lot of uh, these machine learning as methods only because it's so accepted. Mm -hmm. But I would really like to know your opinion and on this thing about Miguel said this, uh, these words the last time that he gave the colloquium and I agree totally. How do we deal with the black magic box that is all of this? I mean, how we deal with this? Because Yes, this is, a, this, this is a very nice question. And I think this black, uh, I mean, it's, it's, you deal with this black box. So there are two things. So one thing is uh, people don't understand it. Uh, and then uh, it's considered black magic in this black box. And I think the yeah. way you, yeah, I think the way you, you fight against that is by teaching these techniques to young people, right? Yeah. <laughs> because uh, it, it should be part uh, as the, the same thing, you know, we learn uh, linear regression uh, in, in, in our astrophysical courses and we need, we learn other numerical techniques. You know, we need to learn these techniques because these are the way we will process the data, right? And as you have more and more people learning and, and knowing about these techniques, it becomes less magic because it's not magic. <laughs> it's, uh, you, you, you can understand that. I, I, there are I some, understand. There are, I mean, it's, there it's are some like limits. A black box, right? Yes, well, it's, some, it's a black box in some sense, depending on what you do, right? Of course, you lose some degree of control, right? But um, if you think about that, how much of the soft, how, how many of the software packages we use are still black boxes? Do you know exactly how Sextractor works? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I mean, is I anyone, yeah, and we I mean, can tell, I, mean, if, uh, if you, if you, I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I mean, I understand that, but there's like a, some degree of knowledge that we know, for example, in simulations, also simulations can be kind of a black box until some degree. Yes. And I understand that uh, 
okay, I mean, we, we don't know everything and you can go as further as you want. You can say you don't know, I mean, the compiler and the insights of a compiler either. So I right. understand, but uh, more is like abusing the, the tool. I'm, I'm, no, I think, and this and is a, it's a completely different thing. Yeah, abusing the tool or not using the tool properly, knowing the limitation is a problem. Yes. And this, yes. I think, yes. it's yes. it's far it's fought by you know teaching people because if you know how these techniques work, you don't make mis I mean, you yes. might make mistakes as another as with another technique, but you know what are the limitations, yeah. you know what are the errors, and you can state them properly yes. in a given publication, right? But this yes. idea of yes. saying uh, no, it's a black box, I cannot use it. I think, I mean, this is reflects somehow on an understanding because we use plenty of black boxes every day yeah. in all the science we do. Uh, and it's just that they are accepted, you know? Uh, if I ask you why yeah, Sextractor yeah. has the blended these objects that way, many of the people I mean, won't, won't be able to ask yeah. to answer that question. Or why, what is the mag auto magnitude that you use? And what are the limitations of using mag auto? Um, I don't know. Uh, and this is yeah, just. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I was. Just, I just wonder what was your opinion on this because. Yeah. So uh, I think that teaching is important. Teaching is important, and knowing what are the limitations. And again, not using mm -hmm. this as black magic, okay? Because indeed, you see some papers that say <laughs> I use, you know, these to estimate that, and there are no errors estimation. There is no uh, no description of what is the training. What are exactly, the limitations? Exactly. Exactly. This is a problem, mm -hmm. but exactly. this is a problem because yeah. it reflects, you know. Uh, you know, but that people don't know what they are doing, but, but I think you can do it by you, with yeah. teaching. And it reflects also another point is that the referees don't know either how to referee that, right? But this will, will change. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so too. And it's great. It was a great talk also and very useful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, and also I think it's extractor. I think it is a, a neural network for for uh, for separating stars. Indeed, indeed, yeah, and, indeed. And everybody uses it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's a neural network model that separates the stars and galaxies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So next we have uh, Miguel and then Jacopo. Okay. Well, Mark, uh, first, uh, very nice talk. Thank you. That was really really nice. Thank you for sharing this with, with us. So I actually I have two disagreements with things that you said. I okay. don't want to be combative, just to, to, to bring some, some discussion, no? Sure, sure. So you say that uh, in your summary that deep uh, learning supervises rich maturity. I would actually say the opposite. I think that we are just starting with deep, with deep learning. Because like you, you, you say something very, very important. So uh, when you were describing these results with the, with the compaction galaxies, you say, yes. well, the galaxy is able to, to identify this somehow and I think the key here is somehow that we don't know what the galaxy found that was different between pre-compaction and compaction and post-compaction. So I think there right. is a whole field there for us to, to explore. Yes. Because right now yes. we, we are just like, like what Pedro said, we are in this black box. Somehow the neural network was able to do this and that and that. But we want to understand right. physics that yeah, we are, we are a physicist. So we want to understand why. Right. So I would, like I said, so not to be combative, just to bring some discussion, not just to know, your, to, to know what, yeah, so, what you think. So I think it's a very good point. And then, um, so interpretability is something I haven't entered too much here, and I think it's important. But again, it depends on the application. What I mean by reaching maturity, it means that there are cases in which you will use this machine learning because there's no other way, and you don't care much about interpretability. For example, if you are classifying, separating stars from galaxies, I don't care how the network is doing it. I just want a separation as good as possible between stars and galaxies, right? And, uh, and uh, also, I mean, even if you do morphological classification, you want a good accuracy, right? Um, now, no. um, and this is, again, I, I mean, this is a, a very, you know, old discussion in machine learning. And there are people that, you know, want interpretability at, every, at all price and others that uh, don't. You know, deep learning indeed, lose i mean you gain in accuracy but you lose in inter interpretability right uh, I think you, can I, I, both. you can do both but not with the same accuracy right at, at oh. this stage and not for with example, the same architectures so i think the problem not with is the, the same. architectures that we have yes but they are not I mean, you know i think there's a trade off whatever you do it's a trade off i know your work and but i think whatever you do it's a trade there is a trade off between interpretability and accuracy and again then it depends on what you're looking for Right? So I'm saying that for some applications, you don't care much. And, and you know, 
you know, um, uh, Jan Lequin, who's uh, one of the fathers of deep learning, always it's it's for example he's for example uh, against interpretability. He doesn't think it's something that we should put efforts on, and we, he always says this example of if you know if you have uh, cancer, uh, what would you like to? It's going to a doctor that tells you uh, maybe you have cancer at 80% probability, and I tell you why, or you want a machine that tells you. I don't know why, but you have cancer at 99% accuracy. Yeah, so, no, no, locally, we are not doctors. Right. But I mean, uh, you know, it, it depends on, again, on the application. The, this said, I think that you are completely right. So that uh, for this application, particularly of compaction and so on, and learning physics, it's super important. And I think interpretability is fascinating. And I think we, will, we should go forward to that. Um, and, and, uh, as, as far as I know, uh, all the interpretability, you know, techniques that can be used with uh, are still quite, you know, uh, limited, limit, uh, I, quite limited, yes, yes. let's say. Yeah, yeah, like I said, so yeah, we have a lot of work. So this is, this is good news. Yes, we have, yes, we have exactly. But what, uh, let me just again clarify that when I said reaching maturity is, you know, at the pipeline level, I, I mean about classification, uh, segmentation, and so on and so forth. Now for other more complete, uh, complex tasks, I think it's not, right? This is what I was saying, so. and uh -huh. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, no, last week I presented several examples of black boxes, you know, because yeah. of course yeah. they, are, they are really good, like the examples that you showed, they are amazing tools, but uh, yes. we want more, as physicists, we want more, we want to understand things, okay? So in, related to this, so you, as, you mentioned a couple of times that we had to teach the students these techniques and, and on this, of course, I, I am very passionate about teaching the students these techniques, but I, I'm, I'm also very passionate about telling them that these are really limited techniques and they should not think that these are solution for everything. Uh, uh, so one example that I've, But this I've part of my teaching, right? This. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for instance, uh, so but we will be careful when we teach this that we tell them, okay, we understand how this neural network work and I'm, I'm going to show you how they work. But that doesn't mean that we understand what happens inside, like the PDF, no? That doesn't mean that because I know that it gets a PDF that I understand what this PDF exactly. is. Exactly. Yes. So yeah, yeah. I careful. think a teaching, teaching means understanding the, I mean, teaching the limitations too. When you use a tool, you know what are the limitations and when you can use it and where not. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think this is part of the, of the teaching, of course. Yeah, my fear is, uh, I don't know, I work in large scale structure and for years we saw, for decades, so I was not there, but I was not there, but for decades we, in the field people use super correlation functions to describe the cosmic wave when we know that that is probably the least worst thing you can do. You know, there are much better techniques, but that was the, that was the, the most common technique and everybody was teaching two point correlation functions when, when we knew that that was not the best. So I'm just afraid that we, that we get there. I have this trauma no, from <laughs> okay. <the> <laughs> <laughs> I understand. No, but I think there's no way around. I mean, it's not saying that we only need to teach us, but that these techniques should be part of the curriculum of any, you know, student uh, yes, in physics. Yes. I think this is unavoidable. Yeah, yeah. And that gives an extra tools. Yes. Even if they leave us academia, yeah. I don't think, yeah, exactly. But this is another thing, yeah. But uh, this is also another problem that I have uh, maybe with the students, just, I mean, I diverging a little bit, but because this is now very, you know, appealing and these techniques are very, you know, interesting and also students are looking for, you know, job opportunities. I have lots of students coming to my office and say, I want to do a project on machine learning, whatever. I don't care, you know, about what's the astrophysics behind. And this is also some problematic. So I always tell my students, okay, machine learning, you're doing, you are an astrophysicist, you are doing physics. And then machine learning is something that can help you doing the physics. It's not, you know, the goal. And, and sometimes this is, uh, this is happening, you know. Mm. Oh, thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. That's very nice. Okay. Yeah. Interesting discussion. This is why I'm inviting experts in AI so that we, we understand these techniques a bit, a bit better. Um, so, Jacopo, uh, have a question. Hi, uh, indeed the talk was, was very nice. I have just a, a sort of technical question. So do you, you have your code to do uh, whatever uh, deep learning or machine learning analysis. Did you write the code or are you fishing in the what's available to implement it? Well, it depends on at what level you talk. So uh, today uh, you use um, high level libraries, you know, you don't code the neural network from scratch. Nobody will do that. You use, you know, 
standard uh, libraries uh, re written in Python, like TensorFlow or something like that. Uh, now, regarding the architectures and the, the techniques we use, uh, I'm more a user, so so I'm not a machine learning researcher. As I said, I'm an astrophysicist, right? So I'm not uh, because all these. Uh, I mean, for example, the VAE or the GANs. These are techniques that exist. Okay, so I'm not inventing them, but then you adapt them to your problem. Okay, uh, which is not the same as developing a new technique. Okay, uh, in my case, I don't know but, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, sure, it, it does actually. So. Uh, there's plenty of open source code, I guess. Written yes, open. exactly, exactly. So it's the same as you know. Um, if you do, if, if the question is, if for example, if you ask me, uh, when you do chi square fitting, did you you know code it uh, from scratch or you use some existing procedure? Well, you would say I'm using uh, you know Python and then I'm using linear regression and then I am adding the functions. This is more or less the same. Okay. And. Uh, yeah, maybe it's a bit of a generic question, but how long does it take? So if you have this code, you have a problem, uh, like a fitting, I'm, I'm interested mostly in SCD uh, fitting. Right, so, right. Uh, what's, how long does it take uh, on a time scale, generic time scale, to, uh, in, to, make, to, in, to make the two parts uh, interfacing themselves? So the, the machine learning, the solution and the problem, let's say. Mm, what do you mean? How long it's how difficult I mean, it is to implement? Yeah, yeah. Because so I I would say some 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 to adapt a pro, uh, a given architecture to your problem in general. Yes, yes. I mean this is I think I would say that now is super fast because uh, you know they are very very. Um, the good thing about these things is that they are uh, there's a lot of money put in there because they are the big companies putting lots of money in you know in making these uh, tools as fast as possible and as friendly as possible. So it's at this stage it's very I mean if you want for example to train a network to estimate I don't know the stellar mass of a galaxy from the SCD. Uh, if you have the your SCD your data, this you could do it in an afternoon. It's very simple. It's very now again. This is goes back to what we were saying before, and this is a danger. This is again a positive thing and a danger, right? The positive is that you can apply it very fast. Danger is that everybody can do it very quickly without understanding what they are doing, uh, and then comes the problems. But getting a result, you can do it in one afternoon. Then understanding what's going on, understanding what are the biases, and so on then it requires more time. But the, the technical implementation, I would say at this stage, now it's not a problem. It was a problem maybe a few years back when uh, deep learning started. Uh, you know, I, I remember the first time I, I dealt with deep learning in, back in 2014, then everything was GPU hard-coded. There, there was nothing. And then it was really a mess. Well, you know, I, now it's just a Python you know, line and a very high level. So you do a, near, a neural networking in a few, a few lines of code. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Okay, uh, so now we have uh, René. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark, for your talk. Um, so with the um, classification problem, I, I remember uh, uh, papers from, from way back, like 10 years ago, something like that, comparing human classifications of morphology and, and measuring the bias between different humans classifying the same set of galaxies. And yes. in, in general, with classification, uh, do you think, maybe this is a philosophical question, but do you think that, that these techniques uh, may, may lead us past the biases that, that we could have in classifying uh, things, especially talking about morphology or spectroscopic classification? Or, or maybe, maybe even changing the, the way we classify things, changing the, our classification schemes. Okay, so the, these are several questions here. I think first one is uh, when you do a supervised classification, you are limited by the training set. Okay, so if the training set um, is what it is, uh, you will, uh, you know, propagate these biases. Now, this said, uh, you can have errors in your training set. Uh, and then the network corrects for that, right? Because it generalizes. As far as the network errors are not so large, 
not so dominating your distribution. It has been shown even that in supervised learning, sometimes it helps to introduce some errors. It's called uh, label shuffling or something like that, in which you can introduce artificially some errors in your training set, and then it helps generalizing, and then you can correct for that. So in that sense, you can you know denoise your uh, your uh, your labeling, um, and this is uh, one thing. Now the last uh, question was about can we you know have a new way of classifying galaxies, and I would say yes, and this but you need unsupervised learning. Okay. okay, then you can ask the network, how would you classify galaxies? So you can uh, ask, you just show images and ask a neural network to do what uh, Hubble did 100 years ago. And uh, so Hubble decided to put them in that particular order with the bulges and so on. A machine might decide elsewhere uh, in a different way. And then you can explore the properties of these classes. Um, and maybe they are more physically meaningful, I don't know. And this is something that we are doing also with a, with a student uh, uh, and, uh, in the UK together with Chris Consilis, trying to show how, you know, VAEs and, uh, can classify morphologies without any supervision and how they match the Hubble sequence. Right. Thank you. Okay. And um, let's have one, one final question uh, from Rosa. Thank you, Vicente. Thank you, Mark. Very, very nice too. I have to confess that the only neural network I have ever used is Extractor <laughs> <laughs> many times. But what, what I wanted to ask you, have you done any, let's call it outlier science? What kind of things have you found? And uh, do outliers look the same or similar in observations and in simulations? Yeah, so this is an interesting. So the, the outlier thing is something that we are developing now. So we are, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, this example I showed you is that what we're looking for outliers in the, in the hyper supreme time survey. And, uh, and we found some objects. Now, I, I briefly said that one of the problems with these outlier detections is that uh, most of the things that you detect, I would say the majority, are uninteresting outliers, okay? Because they could be pipeline errors, detection errors, glitches in your mm -hmm. CCDs. Uh, so these are outliers, mm -hmm. unfortunately, but they are uninteresting. So you need first an outlier detection to filter out normal things, but then you need to you know, inspect the outliers to, to look for interesting stuff. Uh, and this is very tricky. And this is what we are trying to understand now, how to visualize this and how to look for interesting objects. And I think at this stage, you ne still need some human in inspection to filter out what should be interesting or not. Um, so in that respect, I haven't looked as, again, uh, yet to what are the outliers in the simulations because uh, for sure all these, you know, fake detections and glitches, you won't have them in the, in the simulations. So in the observation, you will be dominated by these guys and uh, that you don't have in the simulations. So first you need to come up with a way of detecting interesting things and then looking for them in those simulations. Okay. Now, one way was that what, what was mentioned earlier is that, okay, I use this in the observations, I filter out manually what are the interesting objects, and then I see in a supervised way if these objects exist in the simulations. Oh, and you haven't gotten to, the, to that? Not yet, no. Okay. okay, thanks. I'm sorry, can I say something in this? Uh, or, um, or later? Okay, so it's okay. I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> Um, I'm happy to take the last um, okay, okay. Um, and comment. And I see that Miguel also has his hand up. Uh, are you, you, you have something else? Okay, Bero, you, you can go ahead, Bero. <laughs> now I have to think because if it's not like I, I lose the thing. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. So it's it's a, a link with the, with the thing before. And now that Rosa was asking, uh, so the first stage that you were doing is uh, to know which late or early galaxies you have in the local volume, compare it with simulations and observations. And of course that gives you like a degree of uh, how good the simulation is also. Right. But doing it further with the, with the outliers, it's even, you go even further, you know? Right. It's uh, how good really the simulation is. 
And also, are you planning to do statistics on that? Because you can have many kind of local groups, right? Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. What do you mean? Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, um, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I was just wondering, uh, can I write to you? Sure, sure. Of so course. So, you know that yeah. it's me and not crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Good. Be free. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I think we should uh, finish. So yeah, let's let's uh, thank let's thank Mark again uh, for a very nice talk. Yeah. So yeah, this is always so perfect. Um, so yeah, thanks. Uh, we'll be in, in touch for you know, yeah. A paper, so. Thank you, Vicente. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation again. And I'm happy to take other questions or if you want to send me something, happy to be here. Bye bye. Have a nice day there. Bye. Bye. You too.